Good morning. Welcome to Crozet United Methodist Church. I'm Sarah, the pastor here, and we're grateful to have you join us for our traditional worship service. We're going to invite you to stand as you are able and join together in the call to worship, which you will find on your screens. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. The risen Christ is with us. Praise the Lord. Please remain standing as you are able. We're going to begin this morning with our first hymn from the United Methodist Hymnal, number 89, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. join together in our gathering liturgy. You are my portion, O Lord. I have promised to keep your words. I entreat you with all my heart. Be merciful to me according to your promise. I have considered my ways and turned my feet to your decrees. I hasten and do not tarry to keep your commandments. Though the cords of the wicked entangle me, I do not forget your law. At midnight I will rise to give you thanks because of your righteous judgments. I am a companion of all who fear you and of those who keep your commandments. The earth, O oh Lord, is full of your love. Instruct us in your statutes. Please join together in our unison prayer. Thank you, Lord, for the abundance of blessings you shower upon us. Forgive us for the many ways we have turned your gifts into our achievements and so forgotten your generosity. Open our eyes to see that everything is a gift and that every gift is to be shared for your glory. Amen. Please remain standing as you are able and let us sing together the Gloria Patri.
Please be seated. And now we'll have our pondering from Catherine of Siena. I do not intend my creatures to make themselves servants and slaves to the world's pleasures. I owe their first love to me, everything else they should love and possess. As I told you, not as if they owned it, but as something lent to them. And if there are children who would like to join us up front for children's time, you're welcome to do that, or you can stay where you are. It's entirely up to you. We comfortable where we are? Okay. <laughs> so this morning, we're going to be talking about how much God knows us. It's one of the things that is driving our ability to respond in a Christian way. And so this morning, I looked up to see how many hairs are on the human head. You, this morning, uh, as I did this at 9 o'clock, our kids had answers from 1,000 to something like 5.5 billion. There were a lot of, lot of flex there in the ends of theirs. But let me tell you, according to multiple studies, the average human being has 100,000 hairs on their head. Now, some of us are wearing those in different ge geographical locations on our head, but the idea is that there's a lot of hair going on on our head and you lose somewhere between 50 to 100 hairs a day. Hey, you lose a lot too. And so your hair on your head is constantly coming and going, right? The older I get, the more like I feel like it's going, but coming and going. And Jesus says, Jesus says to all of those that were listening to him that God knows how many hairs you have and knows every hair on your head. Now, that is showing us how much God is interested in you. God is really interested to know all of those minute little details about you, all those itty-bitty things God wants to know. And so, as we are thinking about that, we live in a world with billions of people. There have been billions of people throughout human history. And yet, God knows each of us, knows what we think, knows what we feel, knows what we have said, what we have done. And God is paying attention to all of that because God thinks that you are so important. And so as we go about our week, children of all ages, let us be cognizant that God is interested in what we say and do and who we are. And so we can share that. We can share that by singing the songs of our faith as we just did. We can do that through prayer, telling God how we think and feel and what we need and what we want. We can do all of that, but we can also do it by having conversations with other people that God enjoys when two or more are gathered together and sharing the goodness of our blessings. And so we hope this week that that will inspire you to consider the things that you can share with God and with others for the glory of God. And as we continue our worship this morning, we're going to have the opportunity to hear a wonderful musical offering from our chancel choir as they bestow upon us, he will carry you through.
And now we'll have our psalm reading by Gary Ingle. This is a reading of Psalm 91, verses 1 through 6 and 14 through 16. You who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is the shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night or the arrow that flies by day or the pestilence that stalks in darkness or the destruction that wastes at noonday. Those who love me, I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. When they call to me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. With long life, I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. This is the word of God for the people of God. God. Before we hear our second scripture this morning, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, we are here with you and with one another. Your spirit flows forth from the heavens. It binds and connects us and reminds us of the fundamental unity of relationship, both with you and with one another. And yes, Lord, with those who are not present with us in worship this day. So we pray that as we continue to hear your word, that it will become part of who we are, the thoughts that we think, the words that we speak, and the acts that we take. So that above all, Lord, your relationship will not only bless us, but bless others through us. May it be so. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen. Our second scripture this morning comes to us from the book of Genesis, chapter 24, verses 62 through 67. Now Isaac had come from Bir Lahai Roy and had settled in the Negeb. Isaac went out in the evening to walk in the field, and looking up, he saw camels coming, and Rebekah looked up, and when she saw Isaac, she slipped quickly from the camel and said to the servant, Who is the man over there walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, It is my master. So she took her veil and covered herself, and the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Then Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent. He took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. We continue our worship series today on a Christian response. And today we're going to explore a Christian response to death and loss. It comes in all of our lives if we live long enough that we will experience how death impacts us, whether it's a member of our family, our friends, our church, our community, our schools, our jobs, all of those realms where we enter in and out, we discover that death creates an intense loss not only in us, but in our lives and in the lives of others that we also love and care about. And so it's important for us to consider how we might respond. And if you've already experienced death and loss, then perhaps this will be a time to add to your ability to respond rather than just react. So let's explore a little bit more about what it means to respond versus react. Respond shares its origin with responsible. So a response is considerate and deliberate. It is a statement about intentionality. It is engineered to produce a positive outcome versus reaction. 
Reaction means to meet one action with another. And sometimes that might just be gently colliding or exploding as you collide with one another. And so reaction is actually an opportunity to have any number of outcomes, both positive and negative. And as Christians, we are called more to the former than the latter. We are called to be those who respond. That's why so often in Scripture it says to be still, to know, to think, and to pray. We're encouraged to take a moment. I read a quote this morning from a rock star that I had heard growing up who was known for his anger. He was actually known for kind of exploding and unleashing his negative emotions, not just in his music, but in his life. And as he reflects, because now we're older, and as he reflects on that, he said, you know, a lot of times I realized that I reacted to something when I should have just taken a breath, should have paused for a moment. And so for us, it's important to have an idea of how we might pause or what we might want to grasp onto because when you're talking about death and loss, it is very visceral, it is very emotional. And your entire being, from your head to your heart to your spirit, even your body can react to that devastating loss. And if we pick up on our story here, Isaac has experienced a devastating loss. He is the only child of Abraham and Sarah. And Isaac isn't just an only child. He is a miracle baby. He was physically impossible to have. That's what's so amazing about Isaac's story. So you have to think about the circumstances under which he was born. His father, who had followed God's lead to leave his people in the place where he grew up and go into a country and a people that were not his, and had continually gone through all kinds of tribulations and struggles, some of which he brought forth from his sin, but I will commend Genesis to you. And so you get to the point where Sarah was trying to do what was expected of her in the family, what was expected to her, of her by her culture. She was expected to get married, which she did, and bear children, but not just any children, a male heir for Abraham. And despite all of her desire and longing and attempts, she was never able to do this. And then the day came for Sarah when she knew that she never would. It had ceased to be with her in the way of women. And as happens to us, her body had finally said to her, we are closed for business. There will no longer be a child for you. And you have to wonder about the loss that she was feeling, the loss of potential, the loss of expectation, the loss of triumph, because she wanted to give Abraham a child. But then God did something that only God could do. God ensured that she would, in fact, bear a child, and that is the miracle. She did something that medical science still hasn't figured out how to do in 2022, she was able to bear a child for Abraham at 90. Some of us are like, I don't know if that's a miracle or if that's a problem. But for Sarah, it was everything. It was so exciting. This was it. This is what she had always wanted. And here he was, a wonderful boy that they named Isaac. And so Isaac grew up not just the apple of his mother's eye, he grew up as this living, breathing proof of God's power. He was the fulfillment of hopes and dreams and promises and expectations. And even though she was in her 90s, when he was a child, she was able to say, yes, because of God, I have finally been able to do what everybody in our families and in our culture and our society thought that I should do. It was a different understanding of the role of people in society, but she did it. And she loved him and she cared for him and he got almost all of her attention, I'm sure. And so she has died at this point in the text. And Abraham has mourned her by purchasing a field with a cave where he could inter her body and know that she had a final resting place. But we don't really get much about how Isaac was mourning outwardly, even as he was grieving inside. We don't get a lot about that. But our story picks up after a lot of things have already happened. And what happened is that after Sarah died, 
Abraham realized that because of their age, that Sarah and Abraham had not been able to do something that would have been done when they were younger and more capable of doing it, and that is to secure a wife for their child. Because Isaac would need a wife, he would need to start his own family, he would need to have his own children to inherit all of the blessing that God had given this family, and to continue the covenant that Abraham had entered into. And so Abraham starts to realize that time is fleeting. And so he says to one of his trusted servants, I need you to go back to my people, not to the foreigners here, not to the Canaanites. Go back to my people and find a suitable wife for Isaac. No pressure. But the servant leaves. And the servant tries to prepare himself, takes multiple camels, takes other servants with him, takes lots of treasures and gifts in order to cajole whoever he finds their family into letting her come back with him. And he ends up arriving in a place where Abraham's people might be from. And he does what everybody does in the Bible when you're looking for a single lady. You go to a well. And he goes to the well and he starts to pray to God. And he prays to the God of his master. And he says, Lord, I need your help. I need you to help me find who it is that you want for your servant, Abraham's son, Isaac. So here is what we'll do, Lord. I will ask the young woman when she comes if she will get me some water as she is out here fetching water. And if she is the one that you want for Isaac, may she respond with, I will also water your camels. If you've never had the opportunity to see a camel drinking or appreciate the vast amount of water that those animals can consume, then let me tell you, he had multiple camels. This went from, you know, I'm going to go out and get a little exercise while getting water for my family's household to I am now in the midst of an Ironman marathon. The amount of work that she was going to have to do to constantly get the water out of the well and go back and forth to water not only him, but all of his camels. And so she arrives there, Rebecca does, and the scriptures tell us that she was a very good-looking young woman. And so the servant says, let me try her. And he says, you know, may, may I have a drink of water? Will you get me a drink of water? And of course she goes, yes, and I will water your camels. And the servant's like, yes, thank you, God. And so they convince her family to let her come back, telling who Abraham is and Isaac and what his errand is. And they come back, and that's where our text picks up for today. They are almost back to the familial compound where Abraham and all of his servants and his wealth are amassed. And Isaac is there, and Isaac is out. I guess he's got nothing else to do. The work for the day is done, evening is setting in, and he's walking in the fields. And Rebecca spots him, and she says to the servant, is this Isaac? And the servant says, yes. And then the servant is able to tell Isaac all that had happened, all of the story, which is a great story. You should really read Genesis. <laughs> it's a great story. And Rebecca prepares herself for this future that she has entered into puts on her veil, gets herself ready. And then our story tells us something pretty remarkable. It says in verse 67, Then Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent. He took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. He had been living in his mother's tent. Often in this culture, uh, even though they were married, men and women had separate spaces. Right? This was before we formally invented the man cave. They had their own man tent. And she had a woman's tent. And so Isaac, as he is grieving his mother, seems to have moved into her tent. Or maybe he never left. But he's there. And if you've ever had someone that you love die, and maybe after the funeral, the memorial service, the, the service of death and resurrection in a church, maybe afterwards you got to go back to their home and the sights and the smells and the sounds, the familiarity of the space and the furniture, it's a... It's a blessing and a burden. It rushes back on you, and, it, and you remember the things that you experienced in this space and the person who lived there and the power of those sensory remembrances. But at the same time, it hurts because their presence is not there in the same way. It's not that they're just going to come out of the bedroom or come out of the kitchen. Instead, it's a reckoning. 
that they are gone in a different way. And so Isaac has been living in this tent, and then he takes Rebecca, and he marries her. He starts a brand new relationship with her. And maybe what God is encouraging us to do is recognize that God is not asking you to replace the one who has died. That's not what God is saying. God didn't send Rebecca to be a new mother to Isaac. God didn't empower the servant to recognize Rebecca so that she could be a surrogate mother, an honorary, adopted mother, none of that. God knew that Isaac had a hole in his being where his mother was. And God sent Rebecca to be a new relationship. And Isaac seems to recognize that. He's not trying to replace his mother. Instead, he's trying to say, I will have a new relationship and I will bring into this relationship all the blessings that my mother gave to me, the things that she taught me, the experiences that we had. I will share that now with Rebecca. And maybe, just maybe, the way that I love and treat her will encourage her to love me so that the hole in my life where a powerful and important relationship once was will begin to feel a little smaller. And I will begin to feel like I have hope. And so a response to death in Christianity means recognizing that none of us are here to replace the one that is gone. None of us can do that. You'll notice that nowhere in the scriptures does Jesus say to his apostles, you are to replace me when I ascend. That is not the message. Instead, Jesus is saying, I am now sending you to shepherd the flock. I am sending you all out together to bless in my name and to share the things that I have taught you. Testify to the relationship that we have had and bless other people with that gift. And so God is not asking you to replace the people that have gone. Not at all. Not asking you to run right out and get a new mother or run right out and get a new spouse. That's not at all what God is saying. Instead, God reminds us in the same words of Jesus Christ, God knows every hair on your head. God knows every person you have loved. God knows all the ways in which they filled you with joy and they made this life better, worth living, a blessing. God knows that. And God is not asking us to adopt a theology, a knowledge of God that is about replacement. In Christianity, we do not believe in reincarnation. It's an ancient understanding that came down through Hinduism and many of the derivatives and reforms, Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism, all of which find their roots in Hinduism. But Christianity does not believe in that. Christianity does not believe that God is going to take the one who has died and plug them back in here and then see if maybe they can find each other in a new life. God knows that that would actually detract from the gift of relationship here and now. And so God says, when your body ceases, when this life ends, I will take all the essence of your beloved and I will hold them for you. I will hold them in trust. And I will not try to tell you that you can find a secondary or a lesser version of that person. Instead, I am promising you repeatedly throughout the scriptures that I will hold them in trust and one day I will restore them to you. It's one of those moments where you recognize that when the Apostle Paul and even Jesus hints at the fact that on the day of resurrection we will receive new bodies, new spiritual bodies that are impervious to sickness and death and sin. And you realize, good thing, because if you suddenly had all those that you had lost restored to you, your heart would rupture with joy. These hearts could not survive that kind of reunion. And the longer we live, the greater the number that we want to be reunited with is. This past week, I had someone say to me, I wish you could have met my grandmother. I think that you two would have really liked each other. And my response was, I can't wait to meet her. And they said, but she's dead. And I said, I know, but we believe in the resurrection. And so one day I will meet her. And when we get into that kingdom to come, which Christ has promised he is already preparing for us, 
then I look forward to meeting her. And not just meeting her, but getting to know her and hearing the stories. Because we're going to have a lot of time on our hands. Eternity. And so all of those people that I have received glimpses or maybe quotes from because they're embodied in the people that I know and love and serve here, I know that one day I will actually meet the source who then can introduce me to their source and to their source. And so the kingdom becomes this place where we get to see how legacy is lived out. One of the things that happens in a Christian service of death and resurrection is that there's generally a eulogy, maybe a homily of hope, an opportunity to offer personal remembrances. And as that happens, and I have officiated and given many of those in my time in ministry, I spend a lot of time talking about legacy. Because I think if you've ever lost somebody that you have loved that much, you worry that the world will forget them. You worry that one day you might forget them. Or what if when you go, nobody ever remembers their name? We have those fears. And so legacy becomes an opportunity to recognize that the things that we have gained from those that we have gathered together to mourn in the passing can be embodied in us and can be gifts that will be given to others. They can be a place where through the privilege of relationship, we can tell the story, not always using words, but there are times where they're invited. I have spent more time talking about my son's grandmother and great-grandmother because of the cooking that they showed me how to do. And somebody would say, I really like your pasta sauce. If they really want to make me happy, they go, this is the best pasta sauce I've ever had. To which I would respond, Nona taught me how to make that. And I go, well, who's Nona? Come and sit down at the table. And while you eat this sauce, I will tell you about Nona. I will tell you who she is. So the gifts that she gave me, even the skills, those skills I use to bless other people, and it becomes an opportunity to ensure that her legacy is not forgotten. And relationship allows us to do that. It's a beautiful conduit. Now, maybe the world has different expectations. Maybe the world expects us to, you know, go through this replacement theory. God does not. God was not expecting Isaac to replace Sarah. No one ever would. No one ever would. But in the hole that was in his being, in his heart, in his life, God said, here's a new relationship. And can you imagine that the first time he took her into that tent, and he said, this is, this is where my mother lived. And these things were my mother's. Let me tell you the story that my mother used to tell me about how I was born, how I came to be. And Rebecca, because our scriptures tell us that she was a good and faithful spouse to Isaac, probably said, I would love to know about your mother. I would love to. And the scripture, in brief but profound nuance, and one of the few places in 66 books tells us that he loved her. And so he was comforted after his mother's death. The new relationship, the newness, was a way in which he could find comfort. Not to replace, not to forget, but to be comforted. Because Isaac existed in a time before people knew of resurrection in Jesus Christ. But God knew Isaac, knew Sarah, and knew that Isaac could not continue to exist like this. And because he was willing to have a new relationship, because he was willing to bring all the gifts that his mother had given to him into this new and yet different relationship, the world has been blessed. Isaac does, in fact, not only inherit all of Abraham's earthly wealth and blessing, but also continues the covenant. And his family has a legacy. In their lineage is the promise that we don't have to worry about 
earning our salvation. We don't have to have the fear that we can't do enough so that God would love us and forgive us. For his is the family that sets the standard of righteousness by faith alone. But if Isaac had withered away into nothing, if he hadn't had a relationship that could help him find strength and hope, and learn not just to survive, but to thrive once more. That promise might have died right there. So as Christians, we are given the opportunity to try to figure out, where are we? Sometimes we are those that are mourning. We are those that have this intense grief at loss, and we are hoping that at the very least within the body of Christ, we can find relationships that will help us to bless and be blessed. Perhaps to find a new purpose in how we love, but not to make us forget the ones that we have loved. But we are also the people who are part of a community, a living, breathing body of Christ, who recognize that sometimes our job is to be a relationship for others, to listen to their stories, to hear how it is with their spirit and their heart to invite them to receive the blessings that we have inherited through our relationships, but also to be a place where they can share their blessings and the things that they have learned and experienced from the ones that they mourn. And our job is to determine the next time there is death and profound loss, how will we respond? Because if we don't think about it now, we will react. And on September 11th, we gathered here and talked about the difference between how people mourn. We talked about that the grief may be the same profound, heartbreaking grief within, but people cope differently with that grief. And external mourning looks very different. But within the body of Christ, there is space for that. There is a place for people to be diverse and different. And yet have our union and God Almighty. And so may we find that we have the opportunity to be both Isaac and Rebecca. We are those who will lose, profoundly so, the longer that we are alive. And we will have those days where we feel like Isaac, wandering hopelessly through the fields at twilight. But because of God's grace and goodness, we will also be given opportunities to be Rebecca, to be a new day, to be a new relationship, a new blessing. And not to supplant the one who came before us, but to complement them and to bring hope. Reaction is a collision. A response is a holy union. And we are called to be holy vessels of God. So no matter what the future holds, whether before long you are Isaac or before long you are Rebecca, may you find courage and conviction in being a relationship, not a solution. Not the one who says to someone, you need to get over that. It's been too long. But instead, one who creates space so that the fears that we all go through will have a safe place to be expressed, to be worked through, and to ultimately be transformed into blessings. May it be so. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. We now will have the opportunity to worship the Lord with our tithes and our offerings, and we are grateful for all of those who are a part of our giving in this church, whether you have already given online or through mailing in your check or whether you are giving with us now. Your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness are part of what builds the community and the body of Christ here in Crozet and well beyond. And in deepest gratitude for not only what God has done for us, but what God will do through us, let us worship the Lord with our tithes and our offerings.
Please rise as you are able and let us sing together the doxology. Let us pray. Lord, as we have gathered before you this day in holy worship, we recognize that no worship would be complete without giving back to you and ultimately giving to others. So we pray that these acts of sacrifice and signs of our joy in you will become blessings for others within our family of faith and far beyond. For you know, Lord, that now that these offerings are in our hands, we need the Holy Spirit to grant us wisdom, to help us be good stewards, and to find opportunities to bless in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May it be so. All honor and glory to you, Almighty God. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Please be seated. I have some announcements I want to share with you. The first is that uh, we do have our vendors for our United Women in Faith yard and bake sale. So now we want to remind all of you that it is upcoming. It will be October 1st from 8 a.m. to noon. Please uh, make plans to come on out and support our incredible United Women in Faith. They do absolutely amazing mission work, both in their fiscal support and in their engagement. And it's a wonderful opportunity to support them. You can grab some delicious treats and perhaps uh, garner some wonderful additions to your life. So we invite you to put that on your calendars. Also want to show you, um, it was lighter earlier because now people have already made donations. We have received this incredible box uh, from Seville Sock Love. And if you have the opportunity at some point in the weeks ahead, there's actually pictures of the two teenagers who developed this mission work. Both Lindsay and Lily Simpson are students who attend First UMC in Charlottesville, and so as fellow Methodists, it's a pleasure to support their work. They collect socks and distribute them through a variety of partner organizations throughout Central Virginia, and we are going to be supporting that by collecting new socks in all sizes. Run the gamut of age. So if you really enjoy chop shopping for toddler and children's socks, absolutely. Or if you just want to make sure people have practical warm socks for the winter, we encourage that too. So we're looking for all of those. And throughout October, we'll have this bin in the back and you'll be able to donate. And our middle school youth are going to make that a priority too. So if you're able, we would love for you to join us in supporting the wealthy cause. And uh, as their mother dropped off this box, I said, well, what if we fill the box? And she said, well, just let us know. and We'll come out and get you a new box. I would love to see us fill at least a box for those who need good socks. And so I hope that we can do that. We'll be inviting our preschool in order to partake in that. And like I said, I was shocked when I came back after the first service and there were already two bags of socks in here. So I know that we can do this and we can bless. And so the next time you're at Costco or the next time you're at Sam's Club, you're on Amazon, you're out shopping and you see socks, throw an extra pair in your cart so that we can bless someone else. So we commend that to you. And we also want you to know that there is a newly formed group called Caregiver Support Group. Uh, they had a very successful initial meeting where they concretized their, um, their concept, and now they're going to continue to meet on the second Wednesday of the month from 2 to 3.30 p.m. over at Tabor Presbyterian Fellowship Hall across the street, kind of catty corner from us. The next meeting will be October 12th, and themes for their meetings include acknowledging needs and how to ask for help, approaching holidays and how to find strength and comfort in that, and allowing time to be yourself. So if you are looking for a relationship and, and a community to help you specifically deal with uh, the stress and the strain, but also the blessings and the burdens of being a caregiver, then we commend this to you. Uh, you can speak with Eleanor. We have her email information, but we can also put you in touch with her if you contact the church office. And then we are very excited about the early stages of planning a summer mission trip for our middle school youth to the Appalachia Service Project. So 
a lot of us came through churches and did this as youth, and we're very excited to connect our youth to do this. We're hosting our first interest meeting today at 4 o'clock to talk about dates, fundraising that would be necessary, and early stage planning. It does not mean that you are locked in. But if you yourself would be interested, either because you have a middle schooler or you yourself would like to be a part of this, either from chaperoning or even supporting here while they go off, then we would love to have you join us at 4 o'clock in the Fellowship Hall. And you can come out and ask questions and get the information that we have. And you can always talk to Bart um, by email, at communications at crozetunitedmethodist.org, or you can talk to him. He's in the back of the sanctuary pretty consistently. And then lastly, real quick, our Impacted Social Justice Ministry is having a house meeting today right after this worship service in the mural room. The Children's Fellowship Group will meet tonight, as will our middle school youth group. And some of you have already noticed that we sent some important financial updates to you, and you'll be hearing more from our leadership on that over the next few weeks. And so if you haven't had a chance to read it, we encourage you to do so. If you didn't receive it and would like to, reach out to us at the church office, and we'll make sure that we have you connected. But we are grateful for all of the ways in which you are a part of what we do here, not just your presence and your support and worship, but in all of our endeavors ministerially and missionally here at Crozet United Methodist Church. And so without any further delay, we're going to invite you to stand as you are able as we join in our closing hymn from the United Methodist Hymnal, number 474, Precious Lord, Take My Hand. so precious that God knows everything about you and loves you through all of the trials, the tribulations, loves you through all the celebrations and the joys, all the mourning and the sorrow. God is with you and will be forevermore. As you leave this place, may you encounter others who do not know that holy truth, and may you share it with them through your words, your prayers, your presence, and indeed your righteous relationships. Go forth in peace in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one now and forever. Amen. <laughs>